All right, we are good. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Inbound Studio. I'm Laura Moran, your host, joined with, by Esther Perel, uh, an author and therapist notable for exploring the tension between the need for security and the need for freedom in human relationships. Correct. Fair? Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with us. My pleasure. Um, I wanted to start with the podcast that you host called Where Should We Begin? And just um, if you could explain to people a little bit about what that is and why uh, podcast as a medium is it like works right. for you and why you've right. chosen that. So um, may I ask how many of you know of where should we begin? Quite a bunch. So um, it's the first time that um, one is invited into a therapist's office to listen in on live, anonymous, unscripted, raw couples therapy sessions. And while you are listening in to the nitty gritty details of other people's lives, what begins to happen is that you realize that you're in fact standing in front of your own mirror. And the reason I wanted to do it is because I have been a couples therapist for 35 years. And I am witnessing the rapid changes of relationships every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, there has nothing in common with the relationship of today with the one that was when I started. But couples are more isolated than ever and have unprecedented expectations of each other more than ever. Mm -hmm. And if in the village you used to hear everybody's fights and everybody's uh, lovemaking sessions, these days your friends can pretty much separate and you didn't even see it coming. So it was also a way of uh, tackling the subject of isolation, mm -hmm. of fake news, which social media is when it comes to personal life, and the fact that more and more we have an, an Olympus we can't reach with a reality that feels very, very far from it and of which we have no real sense of how is this happening with others? Am I alone? Are other people going through this? And it kind of unfolded into a public health campaign of relationships, which is now coming out season three on October 5. Exciting. Uh, um, you know, you were talking a lot with couples, but do you think that expectation in terms of expectation in relationships yes. is true outside of romantic relationships yes, as absolutely. well. absolutely. I mean, that's my whole talk here today. Yeah. There is a phenomenal crossing of parallel tracks that is happening currently. On the one hand, a matching set of expectations. You know, when you come to personal life, romantic life, the expectations that you would have with one person, what once an entire community used to provide. The same person is going to give us security and stability and dependability and reliability and predictability, and the same person is going to give us awe and mystery and passion and novelty and excitement and danger and fill in the bucket. <laughs> um, this dual set of needs like that, that, you know, for most of history, marriage was for survival. Then we brought in the companionship romantic element, and now we want relationships for self-actualization. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing is happening at work. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't just, and you know, you go to work and you don't plan to spend 20 years there and work your way up step by step. You know, the Wall Street Journal had an article I just read yesterday, it was called Quitters Are Winners. It's like the more you leave, the faster you grow, kind of thing. And the more you're going to get better jobs. And this notion that after two years, something has to happen. And if you, you know, I used to say that you, leave, you left marriages if you were very unhappy. And today you leave them if you think you could be happier. But the same thing happens with a job. You don't leave the job, you know, because they close the factory. You leave the job because you don't feel that you have been promoted properly and right. fast enough. Right. And that rising on the Maslow ladder of needs, you know, that notion that it's about self-actualization, about identity formation, about belonging, the fact that we bring to love market economy, and we talk about having a good deal in our relationships, but we bring two relations to work, a language and a vocabulary of relationships. Mm -hmm. We talk about authenticity, belonging, empathy, mm -hmm. trust. When was that the bottom line language of business? Yeah. It hasn't been so uh, because of that there's like it's I think there's like a dual thing happening people are bringing that but sometimes workplaces aren't really like built for it or the organizational structure isn't built for it so what how do you think that in the office people can better talk about emotions as a as part of all of this right I think 
first of all, you learn a language. It's a vocabulary, the same way that you learn the language of productivity, of efficiency, of performance, of KPIs. It's a language. Mm -hmm. And you learn a language, you know, when you practice it at first, you're clunky, mm -hmm. you repeat, it doesn't really sound well, it's kind of, but not really. And gradually, like all learning, first you imitate, then you identify, and then you internalize. And gradually, it starts to become part of the relationship culture. But for that, I also think you know, that it's important to have a sense of how, how do we map relationships. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes the word is kind of mystifying. And in fact, relationships are quite structured systems yeah. you know, in which you straddle two main axes. Structure, hierarchy, power, discipline, um, all the way down to chaos, and relatedness from very close to very far distant mm -hmm. and disengaged. Mm -hmm. Pretty much most relationships can be tracked there. But now you take your team and you look, how are we working here? Is this a very hierarchical, very set system? Nothing can happen. You have to go to 10 different people. Change is impossible, etc., etc. But it's very warm because we have a lot of closeness and it's, mm -hmm. it's camaraderie, but very inefficient. Mm -hmm. Or is it very distant, rather cold, but actually very structured and very efficient, but mm -hmm. not very loving? Mm -hmm. You can map that, mm -hmm. and then you begin to see what are the attributes that we have ample of, yep. and what are the ones that need to be reinforced, and who can do that? Yep. Who can bring the pieces that the other people may not necessarily have, so that you create a real diversity that isn't only about gender and race and yep. background, but it is actually about relational capacities. Mm -hmm. As you've worked with all different people through these relationships, is there a sort of like common mark or common marks of successful relationships yeah. that come up time and time again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm a couples therapist. And uh, I don't know if you know, but in couples therapy, rarely do people come to tell you what they have done wrong. <laughs> they don't really come to tell you what's the matter with them. They come to a drop-off center, and they come to tell me, this is my partner, you know, I will be the expert on what's wrong with that person, and fix it. Um, I think by definition, relationships that do well are relationships where people take responsibility for their share without being mired in shame for it. And it's, so it's safe to take responsibility, safe to own your stuff. And people have a sense that, you know, if you want to change the other, you change yourself. I would say number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, relationships that work well are relationships that really straddle the two fundamental sets of human needs. It's the need for connection and the need for freedom. Mm -hmm. It's that relatedness thing. You need to be able to have a base but you also need, and you, have to, you need to be able to have belonging, but you also need a space for becoming. Mm -hmm. So that's the place where you can express yourself, where you can change, where you can grow. If you can straddle the anchor and the waves, you have a very good system. Same thing on the vertical. You need stability, but you also need change. You need hierarchy, order, discipline. Any parent knows that you manage discipline and love. Mm -hmm. You need a structure, you need organization. But if you have too much of it, Nothing can move and you get rigid and you fossilize. And if you have too little of it, you go into dysregulation and you go chaotic. It is that dance between these polarities where people find their bliss. Can we talk or can you just give some of your thoughts on differences uh, in relationships and how people interact with each other as it goes by generations and cultures and, and you know we might be very used to something at a certain age here in the United States, but somebody older or younger or on the other side of the world in China might have a completely different experience yeah. with that. So there's, there's actually really two very interesting ways to answer this. First, if you go China and the West, sure. if you go collectivist societies versus individualistic societies, this is where the biggest change occurred. The realm of relationships for all of history was actually very clear. Everybody knew in the little town who they were, what was expected of them, how they needed to behave. You know, parents knew how to talk to their children. Husbands knew what to t say to their wives. Wives knew what not to say to their <laughs> husbands. Everybody knew. Mm -hmm. It was clear. Lots of certainty, zero freedom. 
We in the West have replaced rules and obligation and duty with choice and options, and at the heart of relationships today is negotiation. Everything is a freaking negotiation. You know, you start with a two-year-old and you ask them what they want to eat, what they want to wear, you know, and then you, and then you worry that those very same people later on are hard to manage. You know, they are children, for God's sakes. You know, we raise them, you know. Yeah. So that's, that's the first thing I would say that is really um, fundamentally shifted in terms of, of people of different cultures mm -hmm. and different eras. But I think what you can all ask yourself is this, and this is a question that also goes with collectivist and individualistic. What were some of the main messages that you grew up with around relationships at home, in school, in your community? Where you told relationships are central, they matter, they nurture you, people are trustworthy, they want to help you. If you have a problem, reach out. Where you raised for loyalty, or where you raised with the messages that say you have only yourself to rely on. You don't go to other people. People will never help you. People can, will take advantage of you. You count on yourself, and you were raised for autonomy. And if you were raised for loyalty or for autonomy, and that still is your primary code, you will have a different way of dealing with collaboration versus competition. You will have a different experience versus letting people know when you have a difficulty or hiding from other people that you're struggling with a project. You know, all these things, our emotional dowry, we bring to work. We don't become different people when we enter the door of our office building. And to have a clear sense of the map we grew up with gives you, and if you look at your teams and you start to ask those kinds of questions, you get a good sense who are the people who are leaders, who, people, who are the people who follow, who are the people who are good at seeing how everybody else is doing mm -hmm. versus those who are very good at checking with themselves, etc., etc. I was going to ask you... How... Does that make sense? Yes, okay. <laughs> it does. Just, hey, super quiet group here. <laughs> I just see a few like this. <laughs> I was going to ask you what we can all do to better understand each other, but then having, hearing you say that, I'm almost wondering if the question is really first, like how can we best understand ourselves first to then figure out how to understand somebody else? That is absolutely else? correct. I would say... Relational intelligence starts with relational self-awareness. Um, if you don't have it vis-a-vis -vis you, it's very hard to suddenly start to listen to others. If you are self-critical, it's going to be hard to listen to other people say things without hearing them criticizing you. I mean, it's an extension. Yep. So um, that doesn't mean it's just you know, this concept of you should love yourself first. And No, we learn to love ourselves because we are loved by others. This doesn't happen out of context. It's a both and. But there is something about a certain kind of awareness. You know, one of the great levels of awareness has to do with two major distortions. I'm sure not, some of you have never done this, but I have. So one of them is this, confirmation bias. I have a view. Right? I could be here and say, this woman is here to have a great conversation yeah. with me, and I am in there with her, and I'm going to enjoy this. Or I can have this notion, this woman and all the people who interview you, they're always out to get you. <laughs> you know, they just want to make you look stupid. And I am going to interpret every one of your questions with my confirmation bias. Yeah. I'm going to look for evidence that reinforces how I see myself and how I see the world relating to me. That is a major trap. And the second one is, if, you are, if I'm in a bad mood, I will think that it's because you know, there was traffic and, and I, the yeah. circumstances of my day made me in a bad mood. But if you are in a bad mood, it's because you're a nasty person. <laughs> you know, mine is circumstantial, yours is characterological. <laughs> you know, the world is clear. <laughs> Have you never done this? <laughs> Uh, you're here with us right now. You're going to be on the main stage uh, giving what I'm sure after this is going to be an incredible talk. Um, what is the one thing that you're really hoping to leave the inbound audience at large with uh, after your time here today? I think inbound is about innovation and about the future of the workplace, right? I would not have been here 10 years ago 
there would not have been a keynote on relationships at a professional conference, at a business conference. It would have been about KPIs, performance, efficiency, bottom line, you name it. It wouldn't have been about what is considered soft skills. Mm -hmm. And the soft skills are now the bottom line. And those soft skills for a long time were considered feminine skills, which you know what happens to those. They're idealized in principle and discarded in reality. So this importance of saying, you know, relationships at this point are really, A, undergoing a change, but they're also threatened. They've become more and more polarized. And people are less and less able to actually manage the complexities of relationships. Mm -hmm. And pay attention to that. The quality of your relationships determines the quality of your life. Pay attention to it in work. Don't think it's a, a side product. Don't just do it when there is a crisis. And recognize the importance of relationships in your life. It is a, it, it's an interesting thing how, because everybody seems to live it, it's never actually treated like a proper topic of inquiry, rather than just kind of, you know, we're all, we're all doing it, you know? It's not true. And that would be the first message, including here, talk to strangers. Leave your phone on the table when you go to the bathroom, when you're at lunch with somebody. <laughs> you know, call home and thank the people who actually made it possible for you to be here. Put this notion of my relationships and my accountability to my relationships really front and center. It will make a huge difference in your life, in your teams, and in your workplace altogether. Are there people out in the, in the world or that you've worked with directly that you particularly admire in terms of how they approach um, relationships or life or the work that they do or their, the teams that they work with? I'll tell you, the, the, the first thing that comes to mind when you say this is there is no function called a CRO, Chief Relationship Officer. Um, and somebody named this in, who st did a startup and they're doing deep web and the person who, the two people running it somehow on, from the beginning understood that Talking to people is not their skills. They can talk to computers. Mm -hmm. And from the beginning, they brought me on as the person who sits in on meetings, who, who helps them deal with conflict, who helps them have difficult conversations that they've never had to have before. And for some reason, I, I think the fact that this person knew what she didn't know yep makes her more of an expert than the people who are there telling you everything they know. Yep. It's a different way of looking at expertise, right? It is. OK, I have one final question. You, you founders, may have right? given it a, a little bit of an answer. Oh, yeah, we can talk about yeah. that. Um, let's do that. So co-founders have a unique relationship with each other. Uh, and I know you've talked in the past about how there are like similarities to marriages within a co-founder relationship. So can you talk a little bit about how you've worked with co-founders and how right. you know, helped them hone what they need in their relationships? And I will say, you know, I think this, the research says basically 65% of startups don't succeed because of the fallout between the co-founders. This is in case anybody cares if relationship actually matters. Um, and you know, it can be a three people, they sell, they, they still have to be five years. Two of them don't talk anymore. The third one is watching this debacle. How do they handle this? Five years is a long time to sit in such a rut. Or it can be you know, two people who are, have started together. One is constantly looking for expansion. The other one is kind of you know, slow, slow. You know, we don't have to. And mm -hmm. some of them are partners in life, and some of them are just partners in business. But what you have in a co-founder thing is this. At the beginning, for sure, it is passion for the project. It is a love affair in which two people lose sense of time, lose sense of boundaries. Everything is possible. I mean, it actually matches a little bit the story of nascent love and nascent passion. And then you begin to hit reality. And then you have to deal with the cycles of relationships, harmony, disharmony, repair, or passion, mm -hmm. disillusion, Re reconnection, however you want to name it. The same thing happens. Yeah. You're dealing with issues of complementarity. Yep. Instead of polarizing, why do you do it this way? You realize that you actually need that person to do it this way because it's what gives you the opportunity to do your thing. And that notion of working the complementarity is the, the juice of a mature relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's all of that that we work, that we work with. All right, my final question was, yeah. that, so I'll get to that now. And we ask everybody, and you answered it a little bit already, but I'd love you to answer in full. 
What does inbound mean to you? What inbound means on a personal level to me, um, this whole parallel track that, you know, that of, of looking at the changes in personal life and how they are now being mirrored in professional and public space, I began to think from the moment I got this invitation. <laughs> It's actually it's ideas that are just percolating in my head now. And I thought, this is the, this is the world that I actually have never worked in. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I'm, I'm sensing something, yeah. which is part of why I'm here. And I am very excited about this dialogue, Excellent. including the one we just had. Excellent. Well, we're incredibly excited to have you here. Thank you so much for stopping by the studio on your way to the main stage. I can't wait to see the spotlight now. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.